whether you work for a team or organization or for yourself, it's like, how do I create that environment where I realize that it's not just I'm showing up and going to work for a nine to five, but what I'm doing again, in whatever pursuit it is actually really matters. And that's, that's again, game changing. This episode is brought to you by Vimeo. I've been a pro user of Vimeo basically since I started my production company in 2010. Vimeo is for creative professionals like me, and I use it in several different ways. For example, it's a place for me to upload my videos with a password for my clients to be able to review and download the work I'm doing for them. Uh, there's no compression, crushing of black colors, or oversaturation like what I get when I upload a YouTube video. My clients get the full 4K resolution HD as it was intended. I also use it to host and broadcast live events. I also use Vimeo for my portfolio, case studies, and it never has annoying pre-roll ads. I can create a customized player and keep people on my landing page so they don't get distracted and go down the rabbit hole watching someone else's stuff. What you may not know about Vimeo is that you can use it if you're an HR or if you own a company. You put all of those onboarding videos all in one place, a nice, tidy, professional-looking uh, playlist or playboard where people can consume and understand or download all the new training videos all in one place. You could also do the same thing if you teach a course. Imagine putting all your videos behind a paywall, charging for it, and then you know, sending people the link with a password. Need a videographer, creative director, or editor? Vimeo lets you post jobs and find creative professionals. There's a ton more options, so I would suggest checking them out. This episode is brought to you in part by our friends at WeWork. The reason I chose to have an office at WeWork is based a lot on flexibility. I started a decade ago as a one-person company, and now we have a growing team. WeWork has the space and budget for all my needs. From hot desks for one, to a full office setup with multiple people, I can grow, scale up or down whenever I need. I also love the community and other small business and entrepreneurs who work here. It's super collaborative and everyone is in the same boat willing to help each other out. If you're interested in a tour, visit WeWork.com, search by your city and zip code for a WeWork near you. Now let's get back to our episode. I'm Steve Magnus, performance coach and author of Do Hard Things, Why We Get Resilient Wrong and the Surprising Science of Real Toughness. And you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Uh, Steve, welcome. Thanks for having me. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? You know, it, it was kind of something that I, I didn't expect to, uh, you know, take on because my background and my love was track and field and running. So I always saw myself coaching in that aspect. And I always saw myself as, quite honestly, someone who didn't like to write or mm -hmm. actually read that much uh, growing up through high school and college. But, you know, it's like anything. Life just takes us different different paths. And I really kind of fell in love with helping people perform, whether that was in sport or life or what have you, and then really passing those messages down to uh, to others through the medium of, of writing. So it all kind of aligned wonderfully. So let's go back in the chronology a little bit. I think this is interesting because I get asked a lot of questions from my audience, like, how do you know what you're passionate about? How do you know which path to take? So let's go back. Um, in the chronology of young Steve, and what did you want to be when you grew up? What were you thinking about? 100% an athlete. I wanted to go to the Olympics and be a professional athlete, and that's all I cared about. I mm -hmm. went to school because it was an expectation. I went to college because it allowed me to continue to compete and run and all of those good things. So beyond that, honestly, I didn't have a ton of interests. But at the same point, I think what my parents and then those around me, mentors, you know, teachers, professors did really well is they encouraged me to just kind of keep my mind open and, and dabble in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I think it wasn't until I got maybe my sophomore or junior year in college when I started getting interesting, interested in, you know, various aspects of performance from both the physical side and the psychological side. And that really kind of sparked like, oh, okay, like this is something that I'm actually enjoy reading about. So mm -hmm. let's pursue this a little further. So what were your events? You said you did track and field. What, what did you run? 
Yeah, so I was a, a middle and long distance runner whose primary event was the mile. Okay. So that resonates with me because I have a 13-year-old son, actually just turned 14, who is an aspiring track and field guy. And he's, he, well, he's played a lot of sports. He's played flag football. Uh, he, he loves basketball. But really, I think he excels most on the track and, you know, and cross country. And he runs the mile. He also runs the 400 and the 800. So he's trying to kind of find his, his place in the world. Uh, and what was your mile time, maybe like in high school? Where did you, where did you net out? Yeah, so in high school, I actually um, progressed really well and ended up running uh, the mile in four minutes and one second. Wow. Okay, that's incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. so at that time, I was, I was, in, like your son growing up, I played every different sport, and it yeah. wasn't until I got to high school where I dabbled too in different events and just for whatever reason, especially later in high school, just got really fast and enjoyed putting the work to do so. And that, mm -hmm. you know, led me to be um, that year the fastest miler in the country. That's amazing. Uh, and did you ever think, I mean, you know, did you ever think, why can't I just shave that last second off? Or, you know, can I just break four? Uh, I mean, Steve, it's just, it's just shaving off two seconds, right? Like, easier said than done, right? <laughs> A hundred percent. But, you know, and if I'm honest, like through because I never improved on that time, my fastest time um, was still that time I ran in high school, even though I, I kept running in college. And yeah, for the longest time, that that two seconds like annoyed me to death. But I think it also brought in something that has helped me through the rest of life, which is, yeah, it might seem like just, oh, it's just a little bit more. But all I can control is the work that I put in and I put everything in towards like getting that two seconds and it didn't happen. So, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, there's nothing else I can do, but just kind of move forward. I think running in general, especially track and field is such an incredible metaphor for life in general, which is compared to other sports, which have usually winners and losers. I mean, soccer, there's ties. It's kind of annoying, but um, track and field running it's all about your PR, right? Your, your personal record. And the P is underscored. It's like your personal record. Now, yeah, of course you're competing against the, the best times of other people, but really the focus should be on getting your personal time to be optimal, right? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I think that does translate to the rest of your life. And it certainly has with me as well is because we can get so caught up comparing ourselves to everybody else and trying to quote unquote win and you know conquer everything but the reality is all you can control is what you know you do yourself and that gets to this idea on track where it's like well all i'm trying to do is do the best that i can and improve my own personal record and if that allows me to win great but if I come in, you know, seventh place and set a new personal record, I'm not bummed because because I came in seventh place. I'm thrilled because this is the best I literally have ever done in my life. And yeah. I think, you know, if we could take that message out into the, the rest of the world and say, hey, what we're trying to do is maximize your own potential and see what you can do. And if you do that, like you're going to end up in a good space. And for some that might be winning, but... Others, it might be, again, fifth or sixth or whatever have you. And, and that's totally fine because that's all you got. That's that's the best you've you've done. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'll quote a little James Clear here, too, talking from his book Atomic Habits, which is this idea, which is not original to him. I mean, he borrowed it or got inspired by others who came before him, which is this idea of um, how do you eat uh, you know, a metaphor, metaphorical elephant, you know, you do it one little tiny bite at a time. And it's the same thing with progress and growth and improvement. You, you know, you, you can't go from running a five minute mile to a four minute mile in a week that happens. <laughs> I mean, you tell me how long that it took to get that time. It's probably four years of grinding, you know, 50, 60, 70 miles a week. Uh, getting your mileage regulated and um, and then learning to strike at the right time, whether that's, I, I actually love you to walk me through 
that strategy as you're running that mile. Like, so the first 400, the second 400, the third 400, and then the final, like, tell me I'm indulging a little bit because I want to know your strategy. Like, how did you get there? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'd be happy to. Um, it really is a, a game of delayed gratification. So yeah. the end result, you know, you see the 401 mile or whatever have you, but that was, as you stated, like it was literally four, five, six years in the making. Yeah. And especially those four years of high school of I'm going to train really hard and every year you get a little bit better, you go through setbacks, you get a little bit better. And a lot of it is not just the work and delayed gratification, but it's also mastering and how to how to take on that challenge. Because early on when I ran the mile, my you know, my strategy and pacing would be all over the place. I'd be like, oh, the leader's going, go after him. Mm -hmm. And that would be a little over over my head. So mm -hmm. when I ran my best mile, it was literally, you know, I was uh, so precise on my splits to like be as efficient as possible. So mm -hmm. that first lap is all about, hey, I have lots of energy. I feel good because I just started the race and you're almost getting out and putting yourself in a good position, but at the same time, like holding back intentionally. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. if you if you go out too hard, you're gonna pay for it in the last lap. So it's like finding that balance. And then those middle two laps are honestly this <laughs> this inner battle where you say it, it's almost like the goal is propelling you forward and you're seeing yourself make progress as you continue along and you hear your splits and you see your times and you're like, oh, I'm on pace, I'm, I'm here. But at the same time, you have this other voice in your head that we all have that is just filled with negativity and doubts that is saying, hey, you're hitting a half mile you're only halfway through. Does it hurt a lot? <laughs> it, sure, it sure hurts a lot. Maybe you should slow down. Maybe you should quit. And even in my best races, I'd have those thoughts. So it was really about, okay, how do I navigate through this and really kind of, you know, keep a, keep a calm mind where I'm not reacting to that negativity, but just kind of saying, oh, you know, it's there, it's real, but I don't have to listen to you. I can just kind of let you float on by. And you're really trying to bridge that gap until you get to the final lap. Because once you get to the final lap, it's hurting a lot. But <laughs> you can almost like, you can see and smell the finish line. Mm -hmm. And you, you almost like just want that finish line to draw you there because <laughs> it, the, the closer you get, like the more that motivation, it's almost like your brain says, okay, we're not going to protect, we're not going to stay in protect and defend mode. We see the goal is there. Like the reins are off, just throw everything down that you have. And it, it really is, especially that last half part of the lap is just, you're just, you know, trying to do everything you can to get to the finish line and you know dis dispel the fatigue that is mounting and just you know press forward and there's there's honestly there's not many things like it in life where it's just like everything hurts so much but you are also so motivated to get to that line yeah i think you've probably perfectly described the life of an entrepreneur <laughs> like from from start middle finish if it's a, if it's a three act play you know, the beginning, the middle, and the end, there's this arc. Yeah. Super relatable. Um, I love that. Yeah, the splits are important, right? Like, I'm sure you're running like 55, 56 minute splits in the first two, or maybe the first, and then a little slower, maybe in the middle, and then you're just turning on the gas in, in the fourth lap um, to get to that 401, right? Yeah, it's it, it's incredibly important. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the entrepreneur because I think that that same lesson like applies to the work life, especially because what happens? We start our, you know, we we start our we have our idea. We say, oh, this is great. Like, you know, this is going to make us we start pitching. We're all excited. It's like taking off in that first lap and you feel good and you're excited and you go out a little bit faster. Which you is fine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You go out hard, which is fine. 
but it it it's that balance where it's like you can't just like sprint off the line you still have to have a little bit in reserve mm-hmm. and you're gonna hit that lull in the middle where it just kind of sucks yeah and you're and they, just they trying that, to s- go ahead uh they call that burn rate right like so yeah how fast is the burn rate and you know sometimes it's too hot and you gotta taper it back a little bit exactly it's finding that sweet spot right because if in, in that that case it's like that burn rate where it's like hey i need to be able to sustain and keep going and that's what that middle spot is and then once you see that goal and you're whatever it is whether it's you know being successful being acquired having an ipo whatever it is (laughs) it's like you see that goal and then it's back to like okay forget everything forget how we feel like we just got to go and get to that place and you just kind of throw everything by the wayside yeah yeah. I mean, your book in many ways, I, I feel like there's, um, it's an updated uh, Angela Duckworth style book where she wrote about grit. Um, I think there's themes from the Phil Knight book, you know, Phil who founded Nike. I think there's a lot of great themes. Why don't you walk us through the book and talk us, talk to us about, you know, who you wrote it for, why you wrote it and why this timing matters. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I do think, you know, it's like anybody, we we pull from others who influence us. And Angela Duckworth's work on grit is absolutely an influence. But I think what I found is we were kind of at this unique time and space, I think, in the, in the world where <laughs> everybody needed resilience or toughness or what have you. And we were going through, you know, I, I, I was writing this book in the midst of the beginning of the pandemic, for example. Mm-hmm. I was writing this book in the midst of political chaos and, and people were just uncertain. And I think what I was trying to do is add what I'd call nuance to this idea of resilience and grit and toughness. Because often I think the public conversation is almost like, Hey, just put your head down and like grind through it. And that's Mm -hmm. the solution. And I think there's some merit to that. There are times, like in the example we used with entrepreneurs or running, that you absolutely do have to just put your head down and just like forget everything else I'm going. But that's not the only path towards resilience, grit, or toughness. There are also times, like I used in the uh, running example, where you have to essentially say, hey, this is really difficult. But I need to relax into this. Mm-hmm. I need to find that calm conversation or that space where I can navigate these things instead of just, you know, reacting to every little difficulty that that arises and just be be caught in this mode where I'm completely reactive and not proactive. So what I tried to do in this book is just kind of unpack and uh, unravel that nuance of hey, we're all going to face challenging times, whether it's in sport and life and business. What are the strategies and tactics that allow us to to not just bulldoze through it, but navigate through it and get through on the other side with being successful or growing and adapting? So let's unpack that a bit. So what are some of the core philosophies? Yeah, so I, I really kind of uh, wrestled with how to organize this a lot and came up with uh, a couple different pillars. And number one is, um, I call it ditching the facade and embracing reality. Because so much, again, of our ideas of popular conception is, oh, we need to be confident. We need to almost walk through with this kind of bravado and strength. And that's true. We do need confidence. But if you look at the latest science and psychology, what it what it shows is that confidence works. Fake or what I'd call false bravado tends to fail in the really difficult moments when you need it. Yeah. Bravado works on the easy things, not the difficult things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this idea of fake it till you make it, um, it, it only works to a certain degree or maybe in certain situations because... When the rubber hits the road, if you don't have the chops for what you think or say you have the chops for, it's going to reveal it's going to reveal the truth. It, exactly. You know, I, I had a, a great conversation that I outlined in the book on 
with a, uh, a someone in the military and the special forces who told me essentially, <laughs> you know, um, everybody acts tough until you get dropped off in the woods and it's like you alone. It's like you <laughs> and your buddies trying to survive off of like the woods and all this stuff and survival training. Yeah. And uh, he was like, but the real key is having what I'd call like this almost humble confidence where you're just like, yeah, this sucks. This is going to be really difficult, but I need to fall back on, okay, what are my capabilities? Like what sort of training do I have? And if I haven't done that work, like no amount of confidence or faking it is going to help me. I have to have, right. have done the work to, it's almost like confidence needs evidence and that evidence requires putting in the work or acquiring the knowledge so that you have the capability to get through the thing. It reminds me, uh, a few years ago for this show, uh, this series, I was uh, I was myth-busting in a way, and I found myself um, testing out a few things that you know I thought might be easy, but that had a high reward. And one of these was uh, professional bull riding. And I figured, you know, eight seconds, Steve, on the back of a bull can earn you upwards to a million dollars. I mean, eight seconds. I mean, it's not that long, right? One, two, I mean, you know, how hard can it be? And so uh, I actually decided to put that to the test. I found myself out at a uh, professional training facility where there's, you know, live bulls there for the tra purpose of mm. training. Uh, and in, in, bull riding uh the rider is not the star of the show it's the bull actually uh the riders are called athletes and and the bulls are animals obviously um but um yeah uh when i found myself sitting on the back of a 2000 pound bull and then was proceeded to be basically tied down to it uh with the strong rope and then i was told to you know hang on i found myself in that moment thinking I was confident up until about three seconds ago, and I realized, what have I done? What have I gotten myself <laughs> into? And um, and I was faking it until I make it, and then and then the shoot opened, and then reality hit, and it was a totally different experience. So uh, I, I that's love the one that comes story. to mind. <laughs> yeah, I love that story because that that's the reality of of how things work. You know, yeah. it's. It's almost like once that I kind of see it as once your brain realizes like, oh, that story we've been telling that we'll be OK, we might not be OK. Once it realizes yeah. it, it, it reality just smacks you in the face yeah. and you're just you're just stuck in survival mode. Yeah. The bull did buck me off. I stayed on for four seconds. But then when I fell to the ground, the bull stomped on my back. Uh, I had oh, a flak jacket gosh. on. <laughs> I had a flak jacket on. But um I mean, if, you, if you've ever been, like, hit by a car with a flak jacket on, it still hurts. So, um, yeah, it, it was a, a wake-up call. It was a good lesson. <laughs> I learned the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what else? What are some of these other uh, pillars? Yeah, definitely. So the other pillar, uh, which kind of gets to what you just talked about there, is, is learning to listen to your body, mm -hmm. which... I, again, I think often our old model of toughness tells us, you know, ignore the feelings, push them away, like no sign of weakness, all that stuff. And instead, what I try and do is, again, add that nuance of your emotions and what you feel are messengers. So they're trying mm -hmm. to communicate something to, to you. So I'll use the athletic example. If I, you know, go lift some weights and all of a sudden my bicep hurts, well, I've got to distinguish, is that, that that message sending me, oh, you're a little tired? Or is that, oh, you've strained your bicep, so you should stop, right? And I, I think that if we look at emotions and feelings and our inner voice as messengers and learn to understand and speak their language, then we can make that distinction, right? If you've trained a lot, you'll know that distinction right away. If you're you're a novice, you might stop when it's just a little fatigue or just a little soreness, and you're okay to keep going. Or alternatively, yeah. you you know you might train too hard and train through it when your body is saying, 
hey, we get it. You want to get stronger or fitter, but like this is well beyond your capabilities. So, I, you know, and, and the research really backs that up, not only in athletic pursuits, but if you look at um, people who handle grief, if you look at even there's some fascinating research on um, on investment uh, bankers and stockbrokers, which the better they're able to essentially distinguish and listen to like those feelings and those like, oh, I've got this like, huh, I've got this idea of like, maybe I should sell this or not and distinguish those, the better they are at, at investment. Like they do better over the long haul in their job. So instead of, you know, just ignoring things, a lot of it is about, you know, discerning, hey, is this a voice or a feeling that I should listen to? Or is it one that, you know what, I hear you, but you're like my crazy aunt or uncle on Facebook. <laughs> I'm just going to scroll on by. This is a tough one for me, Steve, because I think it's so personal. Um, and also, I, so this is this, this whole idea of training your brain, right? Like, so I'm, I imagine, you know, whether you're a long distance runner or you're doing buds training in the military, training out for the Navy SEALs or whatever you're doing, there comes a point where you're, your brain tells you lies, right? It says, I'm too tired. I can't take this anymore. You know, and so I, as an athlete myself, I have tried to train my brain. Um, I'll give you a recent example. So I've been into cold plunging, you know, who Wim Hof mm -hmm. is, the whole uh, cold plunge movement. Because I'm yeah. a middle-aged guy now, inflammation is a real thing. And like cold therapy is, is works great for me. It helps my metabolism, all these things. But like I get into that 40 degree water, Steve, and my body, my brain is telling me, uh, you can't take this. It's much too cold. Get out right away. It's that, it's that flight mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to quiet the brain and I have to say, no, no, I know it's cold brain, but like you can take it. Your body is strong enough to handle this. You won't get hypothermia, you know, stay in, stay calm, breathe it out. And I'm, I'm wrestling. It's literally a wrestling match with my mind. So, you know, on a broader scale, whether I'm going through something emotional or physical, how do I know whether my brain is telling me the truth or not? You know, how do I, how do I know? So that is a great example um, because what you're essentially describing is how we all experience discomfort. And I think uh, ice plunges are great for this because what happens is you jump in, you feel discomfort, you feel like, oh, I'm... I'm freezing immediately. What happens, you're, yes. You're, no one enjoys you're the experience. In, no, no one does. Your inner voice goes to, hey, get out of this. What are you doing? Negative doubts, you know, escape. Your urge to act is to get out of this situation. And what did you do? You have to learn to negotiate and then also sit with it. Yeah. You're not you're not always because if you if I'm I'm betting I can't speak for you, but I'm betting if you just sat there and said, oh, I'm going to fight this. Like if you just fought it the whole way, eventually it's like the other thing wins. And if you look right. at even what Wim, Wim Hof teaches is he teaches you how to breathe into it. Right. And right. how to use your body to like, hey, you've just got to adapt to it. And I think. This is what it's all about to me is anything, and it doesn't have to be physical, but part of developing that mental muscle and training your brain is to train your brain to, to turn down that alarm when it's not really in danger. Right. Because you're not really in danger when you're in the ice plunge. Now, if you fell into, I don't know, you were in the Arctic and you fell into the water, you'd be in danger. Yeah. But in, yeah. ice in, in an ice plunge, you're not. So what you're essentially doing is, by tr by essentially sitting with that discomfort and s and being like this sucks but like i'm in it you're okay like <laughs> you're not going to die i'm mm -hmm. going to survive you're training your brain's that sensitivity right you're turning the alarm down and you're turning the area in our brain that is related to um like self control you're training that up a little bit so that it's in charge and that alarm isn't yeah. If that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's the exercise I've been trying to do with my son for years. I, I will admit that as a fully grown man, from time to time, Steve, 
I am scared of the dark. And I might be out in the middle of the woods, and it's not that, you know, I'm not in the Amazon, so maybe I'm just out camping, but it's pitch black, and it's, it gets a little scary sometimes. Um, or if I'm in the deep ocean, another good example. Uh, I know that my likelihood of being attacked by a shark is very low. I have a higher percentage chance of probably being struck by lightning. And yet, when I'm in the deep ocean in Southern California swimming around, <laughs> and yet when I'm in the deep ocean swimming around, I, my mind starts playing the theme from Jaws. And I start imagining, dun, 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 right? And, I, I, and my mind starts wondering. It's like, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to quiet the brain uh, in those times. And I tell my son, I said, there are times when it makes total sense to be afraid. Like, um, there's plenty of times to be afraid. And, and it's fine to, <laughs> to, to want to escape that. But like... Uh, if, if, you know, you're in your bed and it's pitch black and your door is closed and you're safe and sound in your house, it's not logical. So you need to quiet the brain down. We've been, the two of us have been working on this for a while, but you know, I don't, I don't have it mastered yet. It's still difficult. No, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And I'm glad you brought that up because again, I think any of those situations where we feel that fear, anxiety, like that is an opportunity to train the brain and it's it's really difficult and often what we try to do is we try to almost like think our way through and mm -hmm. thinking and rationalizing our way through well it works a little bit uh, often it it doesn't right because like the underlying structure that is fear in your brain is one of the most like powerful and basic you know emotions experiences we can have so yeah. it's going to it's going to win out because it's trying to protect you, right? It's saying, "Hey, there might be a shark. Like, I'm not taking any chances." So it's almost like hyper reactive. But yeah. that being said, like you can again, not perfectly, but you can train to turn that dial down. And a lot of it is as I said, sitting with it, but it's also trying different coping mechanisms that almost like create space so that your 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 brain doesn't just latch on to and almost let that 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 fear snowball out of control because yeah. a lot of it is like keeping it there but at a small amount and we can do this through a number of different ways you know we've kind of talked about self-talk uh you can do this actually one of the the most interesting things coming out of self-talk right recently is that if you change your inner dialogue from first person to either second or third person in the brain, it actually like interprets that as like having a little distance. They call it psychological distance, almost as if your friend is giving you this advice. And yeah. Give us a little role play. What does this sound like? Yeah. So instead of saying like, you know, you're, you're, let's say you're in the middle of your ice bath. You're saying, I got this. I can do this. You know, uh, I, I've got it. No problem. Instead of using that I, you can either say, you know, you've got this or even more powerful, it, it seems like. And it sounds weird, but Steve, Steve's got this like Steve can do this. Mm -hmm. And it sounds weird, but that's part of the power because it sounds weird. So it's almost like your brain says, hey, wait a minute. This sounds different than the normal <laughs> inner inner dialogue that we use. And another trick on that is also is, again, most of this inner dialogue is silent, right? We're just saying it in our head. But again, some of the recent research, uh, which is really intriguing, shows that if we start saying that out loud, it's almost, again, a it almost jolts you out of this moment. And if mm -hmm. you watch enough professional sports, like tennis players do this, professional tennis players do this all the time, you watch them before they're about to serve, and several of them will just talk to themselves. And you're like, why is this person just like talking to themselves before, you know, serve? Well, it's because they're about to do something that is incredibly difficult and demanding and takes a high level of skill. And they're ex where they're probably experiencing all sorts of anxiety. So they're talking their, their way through it and just happen to be doing it out loud. And, you know, lo and behold, the psychology tells us that that's super effective. Yeah, I, I'm, 
I'm never not amazed with the human brain and the capabilities, right? Whether that's to heal itself or to talk ourselves in or out of things or to, <laughs> I mean, I just actually uh, just thought of this sort of ignorance is bliss example too. Have you ever seen this viral video of this? I think it's this woman, it looks like China, and she's running what looks like a rope bridge. It's a pretty sketchy bridge that's like, like a thousand miles up in the air, right? And they usually put a harness on the back of her, like a bungee kind of harness, so she can hop from from step to step across this bridge, except for the fact that this time they forgot to hook her up, and she doesn't know it. And she's just casually leaping from, from you know, stone to stone or <laughs> step to step over this bridge, which has, uh, you know, she could fall to her death thousands of feet. And she casually makes it across, no problem, and then realizes when she gets to the other side that she's not tethered to anything and it's like oh shit <laughs> you know but it's usually yeah we don't have that luxury of the ignorance yeah you know i've i've seen that video and it's fascinating and horrifying at the same time yeah uh, the, the story i like to take out of this of that video in particular is the sense of security right she thinks she's right. tethered in so right. she's like oh this is no problem all this stuff well, you know, maybe I'm taking this too far to the extreme, but what, again, all the latest science and psychology tells us is like, maybe not, not to that degree, but if we feel like we're in an environment that's secure, we're going to take risks and we're going to handle like difficult things more so than, than not. And you see this all the time in the workplace, right? If you're constantly under threat of you know, maybe being fired or demoted or whatever have you, you start playing out of a place of fear where you're just like very cautious. You're like, I don't want to screw up. Well, yeah. if, you're, if, if your boss and your environment is more productive and maybe says, hey, like we realize you're going to mess up every once in a while, but we just want like be in the, uh, on the right trajectory, like keep making progress. Like we trust you to do your work. Then you're going to play to win. Right. Yeah. You're going to yeah. say, OK, I'm going to take some risks, but they're calculated risks. And you often end up, you know, way further ahead than if you were playing the, the cautious out of fear game. Yeah, you go from uh, a goalkeeper to Ronaldo taking shots and shots and shots without the fear of repercussions if you happen to miss. Exactly. That's that's yeah. what it is, is it's you're not you know, if you're so afraid of of missing then you're just going to be frozen in fear and your brain's going to get this idea of like, oh, like, let's just protect. And what does protect mean? It often means like, you know, that flight mechanism, which is like be anywhere but here. So you mess up where if yeah. you're, you know, you're taking on the challenge, you're just like, OK, I'm secure. I, I can do this. You know, let's go. Yeah. Also, when you're in defense mode all the time, you're just playing small and and you're you're not living you're not you're not achieving or you're not performing to your full potential exactly and i think that's what it is is it's like yes yeah, sometimes you're gonna have to play defense but what often happens is we get stuck playing defense and yeah. stuck in that protective mode and we've got to be able to almost like knock ourselves out of it and and in fact you know, interestingly, if you look at athletes who choke or suffer from the yips or, or what have you, where they just lose the ability to do the thing that they're used to, often it's because they get stuck in like this hyper protective defense mode where their brain just kind of shuts down in the sense of like, hey, we're just trying to protect. We're going to we're going to forget how to throw the, the ball to home plate because like that doesn't matter anymore. So it's, yeah. it's how do we get out of that that I think is often the fascinating part. Uh, what are your thoughts on focusing on the result? So like, let's say, you know, you're, you're starting the race and you see all these other, maybe you're at, you know, like Mount SAC, you know, you're at one of these big sort of tournament style races and you go all the sort of best, best in the business that uh, is, you're matched against and you think, how am I gonna win? All, all I wanna do is win how do you feel about like just focusing on the result? Yeah. So what you see here is that results can be motivating, uh, which is great, but they can also get in the way. 
because what they do is they drag your mind towards this one thing that is almost like the be all end all and you latch onto it and what happens is you start almost like straining and like forcing it to happen when we know again whether we're in a sport business or life like the good stuff doesn't come always from like forcing it you almost have to like put yourself in the place and then trust that you can get it done and mm-hmm. like do the work and then get in you know maybe that mythical like flow state and we don't go in that flow state by like forcing so instead of like obsessing about the result what i like to do and this is kind of cliche but it works and the that's the reason it's a cliche is that if you figure out, okay, what are the steps that, that I need to complete to get the result, then I'm going to figure out those, st- and then I'm going to focus on those steps. And right. that is a- again, the focus on the process model, which is like pick out the things that I think, or I know will end lead me to that end result, focus on nailing those. And if I do that, the end result will take care of itself. Yeah. Are you superstitious at all, Steve? Like athletes are uh, overwhelmingly superstitious about maybe what they wear, how they wear it. Are, are you superstitious at all? I I was when I was competing for sure. Mm-hmm. What, what was your thing? Oh man! So I always had to wear like the same style of socks. Um, <laughs> put them the socks. on. Yeah, it's the socks. It's like. The, the most inconsequential thing, but it was like <laughs> the socks on at the right at the right time, at the right moment, in the right way, same style. And then the other thing that was really important is before I raced is I would just have like the last moments would always be the same, which is like <laughs> I'd shake out my arms to try and relax and then like try and jump in the air as high as I could to almost feel like that that power and 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 pop in my stride and and then get ready to race so it's like you have these certain rituals and moments where you're just like you know these are the things yeah i mean i think that there's a place for that and i i don't know what the science is behind it but i think there's something to that either the rituals that we do or it's just like a mental state right it's like again kind of this mental preparation we do to get us to a place where we uh, can perform at our best. And if it requires putting on the right pair of socks in the right order or or jumping up size again, well, then so be it, right? And I think this can translate over, I guess is what I'm saying, to other areas of our life, if it's business or other things. I mean, there's probably rituals that we do um, to be more successful if we want to uh, ask for a raise from our boss or a pitch an important... Uh, uh, program or plan or project. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think you're, you're spot on and the science actually backs it up. So rituals do two important things that are vital for performance. One, they prime our mind to be put in that, that, that special place, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the second thing is they actually give us a sense of control over really difficult things when, you know, often there isn't control. So if you look at, again, athletes or a in baseball, for example, I remember growing up watching uh, Nomar Garcia Parra just like do all of sorts of crazy things to his, yeah. his batting gloves before. And what the science and psychology shows is you do that because you're exerting control and you're saying, hey, look, brain, I can do all these things and I'm going to do all these things. So I'm in control of this situation, which gives you more confidence which makes you feel like you can have an impact. And in situations where you're about to try and hit a, you know, 95 mile per hour fastball, which is not a lot of control there, like it helps a lot. So that's Mm -hmm. number one. And I think the other part that is really fascinating, and this translates for sure in the business world and asking for raises is there's a priming effect. So when we do something that is familiar, that makes us feel good, that we enjoy, which is often what rituals do because they're like, oh, these things make me feel comfortable. Um, You actually see changes in your hormones. So this comes out of a lot of research in actually professional rugby, which shows that (laughs) 
priming your mind either by ritual or listening to a certain kind of music or whatever have you can often uh, have an increase in testosterone and a decrease in cortisol. And in this case, cortisol is that stress hormone, so it decreases. So it puts us in a place where, oh, we're not as stressed. And then testosterone, what it has is it has almost like a um, a confidence boosting effect where we feel like, you know what? I can go into this this office and ask for this raise. So mm -hmm. I'm 100% behind that. I think if you're doing something difficult in the office, asking for a raise, getting up to you know give a speech or give a presentation or give your pitch, those last couple moments before you go do that, like think about what you want to do and how you can put yourself in a place to perform. Yeah, I like it. Um, do you have a pump up song, Steve? What's your pump up song? <laughs> um, I used to way back when I was when I was competing. I'd listen to uh, this will date me, but I I'd listen to Everclear the band all the time yeah um so for whatever reason that just put me in the mood and i would again you know this is going back in the days but you'd you'd have your early your cd player or your your very early mp3 player and just rock out to it before i'd go and again it gives you that almost like energy and puts you in that place and it doesn't have to be like exciting i do the same thing actually when i'm writing these books like I put on something often that is like instrumental versions of like popular music because that just puts me in a place where it's like, OK, you're about to enter writing mode for the next two hours. Like forget about the rest of the world. Just like focus on the page and get it done. So we can, you know, the more we can tie these either rituals or music or what have you to the activity itself, the better we are. That's often why you see again, uh, with famous authors maybe like stephen king like he was famous for or he is famous for writing at the same desk and setting up his desk so that like he could get work done yeah why does that work you you come up to the desk and it's almost like your brain goes oh yeah we're supposed to write the same way yeah. that you listen to a song and you're like oh yeah this is the song i listened to before i you know i'm about to perform so your brain gets in that mode yeah, yeah. Hemingway did that too with his famous uh, typewriter. Right, exactly. Another mm -hmm. another wonderful example. I, I call it, let the environment invite action. So if the action I want is writing, then have, you know, I have friends who have literally a computer that is just reserved for their writing. And that way they know when they sent down, it's, it's the same as the Hemingway. Like, I'm about to write, so I better, you know, no complaining, just kind of get into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think music is extremely powerful and probably underutilized, undervalued, you know, as a motivating force or, you know, if you're not careful, demotivating force, you know, <laughs> like my background song, whenever I want to get psyched is uh, is Eminem, Lose Yourself. That song just just really, I don't know, it just... Uh, it's a throwdown, like, I, it resonates with me, just, you know, because I, 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 I feel like I'm an underdog. Uh, I've, I've grown up feeling like I'm the underdog, at least that's the story I tell myself. <laughs> and, and so it really pumps me up when I think about, uh, you know, his story of the come up story and, uh, you know, rags to riches, that kind of thing. It's, or I think about the movie Rudy, you know, why that mm. does so much for me too. Uh, that character resonates with me. Someone who uh, has incredible work ethic, but probably not that much talent. That's probably me. <laughs> but, I mean, that's why I like it so much. But then he overcomes, and and uh, he finds, even though he wasn't a starter, he he uh, has the satisfaction of being able to dress out for that one game, and his parents saw it anyway. There's there's got to be something to that. No, I think you're spot on. And I think, again, this is one of these lessons where I think we can learn a lot from sport because if you talk to, for example, I've worked for some teams in the NBA and they are very deliberate on like 
what they're doing, what their message is, what the pump up video is before whatever game it is, right? Oh, I, I want to hear this. So yeah, tell me, tell me, give me the, some, the inside <laughs> scoop. Like, what are some of these teams listening to? Yeah. So a lot of it is again, maybe not spe- is I I don't know the specific songs always, but what they're doing is they're showing like some sort of highlight clip with some sort of music that resonates with the players, and often it's like they'll talk to the players and ask the players like hey what's what's the what's the song that like really makes you hit and then they'll intentionally again like show all sorts of like highlights that really get people hyped up and excited and they're not going over you know hey this is what you did wrong last time right before Mm -hmm. the game they've done that well in advance why? Because like if you're going over what you did wrong or what you need to work on, like it puts you in this negative state where you're thinking about errors and how to fix them right. instead of the state of like, hey, let's let's get us ready. And I remember, uh, again, talking to uh, an NFL GM and who was, uh, you know, part of winning a Super Bowl. And he said, you know, the most important thing to do going into the game is reading the room reading the players like the night before and the day of to see where their emotional energy is Mm. and that dictated like what the kind of pregame speech is right is it is it like hey we're in a good place these guys heads are on straight they're ready to go i don't need to mess with it a little bit or do you look out into you know into your players and talk to them and and you think oh man, these guys are really nervous. Like I need to give them something that like fires them up or just like you said, you know, frames it correctly because sometimes that framing of I'm the underdog can be really powerful. So maybe that's like the path that you go down as you like frame it as, hey, we're the underdogs. We got nothing to lose. Let's go. And I think, you know, again, outside of the sporting world, if we paid attention to, you know, hey, we've got this challenging moment. How are we going to set ourselves up for it through these variety of factors? I think we'd, you you know, see performance in the workplace go up a ton. Yeah. Yeah, I I can't say enough about the value of sports from an emotional or metaphorical standpoint. There's so many lessons, great lessons to be extracted there. I'm glad we sort of fleshed a lot of them out. It's it's very good. Um, As we're sort of... um, you know, in our last quarter mile here, coming to the finish line, what what have we left out that we still want to talk about? What concepts or tactics or advice do you have? Oh man, we we've covered a ton, so I appreciate it. This has been a fascinating conversation, all over the place in a very good way. Um, <laughs> I think the only other thing that I think is really important, if we look at uh, you know toughness, resilience, performance, all this thing is is really the power of meaning and purpose, which is, you know, when you're in that last quarter mile of the race, you can push further if it if it has more meaning to you, right? If it's not just, oh, I'm trying to like do this race and whatever have you. If you know, you know, you got teammates who are relying on you, you're going to push further, right? If you know you've got, family or friends who have supported you along the way, you're going to dig deeper. And the same goes with, you know, again, outside of the sporting world and in in work and life. And the research is fascinating on this, which shows essentially if we have a purpose or a transcending purpose that is bigger than ourselves, we're persisting longer. Our brain says kind of like, oh, forget the damage or the fear, like the reins are off, go for it. So to me, whether you work for a team or organization or for yourself, it's like, how do I create that environment where I realize that it's not just I'm showing up and going to work for a nine to five, but what I'm doing, again, in whatever pursuit it is, actually really matters. And that's, yeah. that's again, game changing. That's a super good point. It's subtle. And I mean, do you have kids, Steve? Uh, no, I don't. So, so I, I'm a parent and I'm a father and I can tell you it's not easy being a mom or a dad, but it's like, you're right. When you have some, someone else depending on you or when your efforts make an impact on this, you know, other tiny human 
who you uh, are in charge of for a little while until they become an adult and capable of making their own decisions. It's like you will push through and you'll do anything. You'll wake up at 3 a.m. to change their diapers. You'll you'll uh, drive them to uh, the trainer to, to do strength and conditioning. And you'll just do all kinds of things. So you're absolutely right. I, I love that um, idea of doing stuff that sort of is bigger than us, right? Because that's how we can build things that last, you know, beyond our years. That's how we can do bigger, better work that matters. It's, it's a super smart message. Yeah, exactly. And actually, it, you know, in those rare cases, you occasionally see this in the news where you see, I don't know, a mom or a dad like lift a truck to save their child. In the research, they call that uh, studying hysterical strength. And they, and they often, and they believe that it occurs because again, you know, it's almost like your, your brain goes, Hey, forget about all those worries. Saving this child or this thing is worth it. So just give yeah. everything you got. And yeah, I think yeah. that uh, th that's the same message there is that when something matters, like we're going to find that extra bit, like you said. And I think we can find that extra, that purpose or that meaning in so many different areas. So it's all about like figuring out what that is and then really trying to cultivate it. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, Always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Backseat driver.